Well, welcome back to Startup Grind. Thank you for having me. Um, how does it feel to have your startup be featured on South Park, honestly? That is a, a childhood dream, but uh, I'm honestly surprised that they didn't roast us. So, it's like, the, a, yeah, it's the only company or the only thing I've ever seen on there that didn't get made fun of. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for coming. And um, so, you know, would love to just start out by talking about and, and learning about what, what surprised you last year? What surprised you at Lyft in 2014? Yeah, so, so la last year was a, a big year for us. Um, you know, the, the company Lyft, Lyft is uh, just about two and a half years old. So it was our you know, se second you know, full year in operation. Um, and and we, you know, we had good, good growth last year, grew about 5x across all of our markets. But the, the thing that surprised us the most was uh, we launched a new product called Lyft Line. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's still just live in a couple markets. It's live in San Francisco, LA, and New York. Uh, but what we do is when you request a Lyft, it's a different mode. You have to input your destination, and we'll match uh, two or three different people up who are taking a trip along that same route. Uh, and we launched this in August, and it exploded. Uh, and now, now makes up over a third of our rides in San Francisco, and San Francisco is our first and, and largest market in the U.S. Wow. Um, but I think it's, it's incredibly exciting for us because that's, that's really why, you know, why my co-founder and I started the company. Um, and that's been you know, our, our vision for the world. When, when we set out, we, we never wanted to create just a better taxi cab. Uh, we wanted to you know, replace car ownership. We wanted to make it unnecessary for every person to have a car or two cars in their garage. And, and with Lyft Line, it's now cheaper. If you live in San Francisco, it's now cheaper uh, to take Lyft Line than it is to own a car. Uh, you know, and that happens because uh, we're able to offer you know, cheaper prices than ever before by, by matching people up together. Um, that and the fact that it's crazy expensive to, to own a car and park it in San Francisco. So is, is, that, is, that what's, is that what's driving products like this? Is it that kind of getting back to the genesis of why you guys even got, in, got into doing this? I mean, that you people, we don't, probably aren't going to go way into your background, but you, you, you're kind of one of these domain experts who's been thinking about this problem for 10, 15 years. It's kind of like you know, when you were in college and before that you yeah. joined all these associations and things to try to help. I mean, you just like had nothing to do with the business or anything. You just like were very passionate about it, right? Right. So, yeah. So my background before starting the company, I was on the board of a public transit district. Yeah. And, and I started, you know, started the company originally as Zimride and then it morphed into Lyft. But the, the idea was, uh, look, um, Americans spend $2 trillion every year on owning and operating cars. And it creates crazy problems for not, you know, not just that it's expensive, but it creates traffic. Uh, it's a massive source of CO2 emissions. Uh, and people you know, are miserable spending such a huge portion of their day stuck in a box alone. And you know, I think we're, we're witnessing the sort of tip of the iceberg of uh, the economy moving from people spending that $2 trillion on owning and maintaining and insuring their own cars to transportation as a service. And you know, what Lyft and Uber are doing is just starting to open up people's minds to, to what's possible there. Uh, but it's a tiny fraction of the market. So mo most people, when we launched, people said, oh, these companies, they're going after, uh, trying to create a better taxi, going after this $11 billion taxi market in the US. But that $11 billion is tiny compared to the $2 trillion people spend on their cars. Hmm. Uh, and you can only you know, get there, you can only really sort of take a big chomp into that market when you release products and you find ways to innovate to continually drive that price point down. Do you think, do you think LiftLine is something as a product that, that you, that your company can own? I mean, do you feel like it's something that, hey, we, like, based on our community, based on our technology, that we can, like, we can do this where no one else can? or? Does it, does it become a commodity like some of these other, other versions of the product? And, and these kinds of products seem, seem to be. Yeah, so we, we, did, a, we did a survey. Because uh, you know, uh, shortly after we launched LiftLine, Uber released a competing product, Uber Pool. 
and we surveyed users to see what they thought of both. And both users said they, they loved that it was less expensive. Um, but Uber users uh, hated getting matched with somebody else, and Lyft users loved it. Hmm. So I think we've, we've built a bit of a, you know, a culture and a market around uh, people who are open and you know, seek out that social interaction. And I think we've done more to make that comfortable um, by sort of establishing a social etiquette from the beginning. Um, but, but long term, you know, Lyft Line is, is sort of a, a stepping stone for us to do what we you know, originally imagined when we, when we started the company. Uh, we, you know, Uber is great at, at professional drivers, professional limo drivers, taxi drivers, but Lyft uh, you know, really created this idea of anybody being able to be a driver. And with Lyft Line, what we imagine one day is any, anybody, as they're headed into work, uh, can flip into driver mode. Yeah. So taking a lift today from Palo Alto to San Francisco costs 70 or 80 bucks. Uh, you know, but one day that trip could cost you 10 bucks if you're getting a ride in somebody's car who's already taking that trip. And, and we released a, a feature a couple months ago called Driver Destination that allows you as a driver to enter where you're going and only get matched with other people along, along that trip. Um, so that's, that's just one of the things we're doing to continue to, to find ways to make it cheaper. Is, it seems like when you, <clears throat> when you ride in an Uber, it feels like you're, a lot of times, it feels like you're riding in like a nicer cab or something, right? And it feels like when you ride in a Lyft, it, it has this, you have that kind of community feeling, you have that, and, and when you talk to these people, a lot of times it's like, hey, I'm a student, or hey, I'm, I'm a, I mean, like out here, you meet a lot of entrepreneurs that, you know, you know, riding home from, from uh, the airport or something like, yeah, I'm just doing this, you know, to make a little bit of extra money. Do you guys look at it like that? Do you look yeah. at Lyft as like this supplemental income opportunity for people? Or do you, do you look at it as it a full-time opportunity for people? Yeah, so we, we worked really hard to make it incredibly easy. And we did a lot of innovation in the space of, of what it takes to become a driver. And people, uh, it takes about an hour of somebody's time to, to apply and become a driver. Uh, we'll match them up with a, a top Lyft driver we call mentors, uh, and they'll be taken through the onboarding experience. And it was so important for us uh, to take all the friction out of that process. And we still have, you know, sort of top standards for background, criminal background checks, uh, DMV record checks, vehicle inspections. Uh, but we've put so much energy into making that a frictionless process to live up to this idea uh, of every car on the road being able to be a Lyft. So because we've made it so easy for people to become Lyft drivers, you get somebody uh, you know, who wants to do it for a few hours here and there. Yeah. Um, and who knows, maybe they, they love it uh, and they decide to, to keep doing it full time, and we welcome both. Um, but I think it's that, that frictionless kind of market entry that, that makes it so interesting. Does the amount of just, I mean, um, well, let me, let me ask you this first, which is, which is one of the things that one of you, I've, I've, interviewed many of your investors, and uh, we had Manu Kumar here yesterday, uh, yeah. who's one of your very, very earliest investors. Um, but I don't think he said this, but I've, I heard one of your investors say that you had trouble raising funds originally because as one investor put it, they thought you were too nice. <laughs> yeah. So, we, so I, wonder, I wonder how were you able to overcome not being a total jerk <laughs> and raising <It's>, money? <laughs> That, that was a pretty funny, funny experience. That was actually, that was Ann Murico from Floodgate that yeah. said that. Um, you know, I think what, what she came to see and what, what's actually been a, a huge asset for the company has been the, the culture. And the, the default interaction, right, when somebody is taking a cab, or the, the default interaction when two people get in the car together, is not to be friendly or nice to each other. Like, the default is, you know, people are often really, really rude. And so <laughs> seeing how kind of rough that default was, we uh, put a lot of energy into building the culture and the brand around Lyft. And now when two people, you know, driver and passenger, or with Lyft line, multiple passengers get in a car, there's this like kind of expectation of being nice. Uh, and I think we've done a lot to, to drive that home. And it's, it's now one of the things when you talk to a Lyft driver and you say, you know, do you prefer driving for Lyft 
you know, or if, if they have tried Uber. Uh, you know, every driver you know, prefers driving for Lyft because passengers treat them better. Uh, it's a better experience um, and vice versa. So anyway, I think uh, it, can be, it can be tough sometimes uh, not being a, a jerk, but I think uh, it, it goes really far in building a culture. Does, does the amount of anger, you know, on this note, like, you, you know, you have very pure intentions, and you can just see, right, you listen to Logan talk for five minutes, you know, like, he's just a nice guy, right, you're just a nice person, right, but, like, has, does the anger and hostility that has come into your startup, and, like, you know, there are these people that are so passionate about it in a positive way, there's so many people that are passionate about it in a negative way, has it surprised you, um, you know, in, it, like, is it, is it shocking to you, or is it like, no, like we expected, like what, what, what is your take? Yeah, so I, on, the, on the regulatory front, there has yeah. been uh, a, you know, a ton of noise, a ton of interest. Um, essentially, <clears throat> what cities have done around, around the country is they've created a, a government-mandated monopoly with a taxi cab medallion system. Uh, most cities have one, and they say there can only be 1,000, 2,000 cabs on the road, and you have to own one of these medallions. And so when we go in and threaten that sort of existing monopoly, uh, you know, a lot of people have, have a stake in that. And there's a lot of political, there's a lot of noise and political positioning. Uh, but ultimately, what, what's happened you know, in almost every city is they've, you know, we've worked closely with them to create a new sort of wave of regulations. Uh, we, we updated regulations in 29 jurisdictions just last year and expect this year to be similar. Um, so I think there's a general, you know, cities want, we did an economic impact study, and just in California alone, uh, Lyft injected $150 million into the economy through people taking trips and spending money locally that they wouldn't have, uh, and creating jobs where, you know, drivers uh, earn money that they then, you know, spent in the local economy. So it's, I think it's, it's time has come, um, and all the regulations are changing, but that's, you know, it's a messy process. Are some of the regulations justified? I mean, do you, can you relate to any of their, to their issues, or is it, is it, is it all just completely out of date? And... <laughs> no, no, so none of the noise is, is around the sort of substance of the public safety portion of regulations. Yeah. The noise is just around a monopoly that's trying not to go down and that sort of knows its days are numbered. Uh, but, you know, Lyft does, um, you know, in most cases, uh, more background checks and more stringent background checks uh, than existing regulations require for taxis and limos. And so what we do is we work with the regulators to actually get that cemented uh, into law. Um, but there, there are really sort of silly rules in some places that people can't use their own car, uh, you know, to give other people rides. And that, that's the type of regulation that we have to change. Are you fighting an industry that just needs someone really mean at the chart, like at the front? Like, do you, do you ever like, feel like, like I, I got to just stomp on this guy or nothing's going to get done? I mean, do you, do you feel, does it feel that way, or can you like, you know, can you kill people with kindness, kind of thing? You know, is it like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, does yeah. it does it take like, do you have to fight fire with fire and fist with fist, or can you, you know, bring up, you know, I mean, like, I, and I, I'm not trying to like trivialize, like, I, I, I really respect it and look up. I love the Lyft brand. It's a lot like our brand in, in the, the kind of the community values and things. But I wonder this about ourselves too. Like, you know, do you have to fight fire when uh, you know with with fire? Or can you can you do a new way, have a new way of business, and and actually win that way? Um, yeah, I think when when it particularly when it comes to the regulatory environment, um, being a jerk doesn't actually get you very far because uh, the you know the folks that you need to to work with are the ones who are making the decisions. Um, and a lot of the, the other companies in the space have really uh, left a bad taste in regulators' mouths. And, and it's actually been a huge advantage when, when we come in and we take the time to sit down and get to know them, explain the business, explain what we do. Uh, I think we've gotten a lot further in being able to change regulations with that approach. So you need to be, when it's, you know, when you're dealing with a regulator that's being paid off by the taxi industry, you need to make that public, you need to get loud, you need to, you know, uh, get the community involved. Um, and we don't hesitate to do that, but I think there, um, you can be smart about how you apply political pressure and you, 
being a jerk doesn't actually get you anywhere. Is this a winner-take-all market? Yeah, so a lot of people ask that, and I think Uber's trying to, uh, you know, trying to tell the world that, uh, that that's the case. And what we are seeing is it's, it's absolutely not the case, and it's not in most industries. So in, uh, in 2014, Lyft took market share across the board, uh, and we took the most market share actually uh, in our largest city in San Francisco, which is also one of Uber's largest markets. Um, and so what, what we're seeing is in each market, um, the network effect for this business is really interesting. There's, there's really no international network effect like you have with a Facebook or even Airbnb where people are connecting between countries. There's actually a modest sort of national network effect. It's really each city. And in each city, you need to operate at scale so that you have fast pickup times. Uh, but once you get to you know, approximately a three minute pickup time, there's really no benefit uh, to having you know, additional scale um, as far as the user experience or the strength of the business is concerned. And, um, and at that point, you have, you have the network to compete. And so you know, Lyft uh, you know, has that scale in our top markets, and we're working on building that scale across the US uh, in all of our markets. And once, once you have you know, that three minute ETA, there's diminishing returns to scale. So unlike other communication sort of platforms where there's increasing returns to scale, there's actually diminishing returns to scale in this business. Uh, and we see it, you know, it's playing out more like a, an AT&T and a Verizon, where you know, those companies invested billions of dollars in building their networks. And you know, we're investing millions of dollars in each city to build the network. But once you have it, uh, you compete on brand and experience. Uh, you know, and what the company stands for. And those are, those are all areas where you know, Lyft is winning and, and taking market share. Does the, if it feels like too, there's kind of this constant battle of, or, or you know, the price keeps dropping, which is great for the consumer. But I can imagine, you know, very stressful uh, for either some of the drivers. Sometimes, you know, you hear a driver, you know, will complain about something or how something's different now than it was before or, um, or, um, and, and you, you look at, you know, you guys are, are definitely not fab, but you look at this idea of like so much marketing costs, so, so much spending so much money so quickly and how it can, it can end up just, you know, completely sinking a ship. Do you get concerned about that? Do you get concerned about like, hey, if the price keeps going lower, like, you know, we're putting more and more money in and, and, and managing those things across, you know, across those 60 different cities. How do you do that? Yeah, so, so last, last year was a, you know, a big year for, for our company internally. We went from 80 people to 400, and we brought on uh, a CFO and a CMO, a VP of uh, business development, a VP of product. We really built out. All four. your college friends, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, some, Hopefully not. Some people who had, who had done this before. Um, we brought on uh, Jesse McMillan, the creative director from Virgin America, huh. uh, to work on the brand. Um, and so with with this team uh, who's done it before, I think we're in a, a better position than ever to handle the crazy pace and the crazy scale and to make amazing decisions throughout it. Um, there, you know, there have been a series of, of price cuts, and you know, it's something we're constantly looking at. Um, when you cut a price in a market, one, it, it creates more demand because, as I sort of talked about, you know, in the beginning, <laughs> as you march the price point down and people are spending less per ride you start becoming more and more competitive with car ownership. And so you get more people using the service, which increases business for everybody. Um, but really what we've seen in each market is that uh, each market sort of has its, its own labor market. And you know, the amount that a driver uh, needs to earn per hour in each city is a bit different, and it's different each hour of the day. And so when we sort of adjust base prices, uh, Drivers, it doesn't actually change the amount drivers are earning per hour. That kind of equalizes based on how, how many rides per hour they're doing or how heavily utilized they are. So not to get too technical, but price cuts don't actually have a, a direct Im impact on driver earnings. And the more important piece uh, is the dynamic pricing system. And so when, when you really, when there's you know, a huge spike in demand, the dynamic pricing system keeps in to equalize the market to make sure there's there's always a driver available. 
Tell us about some of the new changes to the cars and the brand. No more, no more furry stashes. What was the, yeah, what what happened? So, uh, I think, you know, my co-founder and I. So it was my my co-founder John came up with this idea when we were first launching. Why don't we put a ridiculous pink furry mustache on the car? And we both thought it'd be funny. We'd probably do it for you know a couple months, get a little attention, and it just it stuck. Uh, it wasn't even our company logo. Uh, all of a sudden, that's you know how people, uh, you know, what, it became that your was mascot, the mark basically. that became our mascot, and you know every single newspaper article there'd be a newspaper article that was about Uber, and it'd have a picture of a pink mustache on the on the front page. <laughs> uh, so it was how we were known. So we we ended up keeping it for much longer. Um, drivers didn't love it though. It was a pain to take on and off the car. It didn't weather well. It got dirty, and so. Uh, the, actually, the, the guy who created the original mustache works at the company now, and him and Jesse McMillan, the creative director, uh, worked on overhauling it. So a couple weeks ago, we, we totally did away with the furry stash and have a new glow stash that's like a, a magnet-mounted thing. It's much smaller. It sits inside the car on the dashboard and lights up at night. Um, so we're doing a lot that you know to make life lives e easier on drivers um, and to, to clean <coughs> clean up the brand. Do you um, do you ever miss it? Do you ever curl up with a stash late at night and just <laughs> remember the, the the old times? No, I've, I've, a I've clean one, of course. A new I've, one. I've got a I've got a one of the original ones hanging on the wall. That's good enough yeah. for you. Yeah, not John though. He probably <laughs> you might cuddle up. Yeah, with it. you know, yeah. cold nights. Um, how, has this changed your culture at all? Has it changed the driver profile at all? Does it, does it have any material impact on the business, or is it just keep business as usual, keep going? No, I think if anything, it's 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 helping helping the business. You know, drivers were getting really frustrated with the old mustache. Just, yeah, it would get dirty. They'd want to put it on the car, but it'd be a hassle. They'd need to get it replaced, um, or they were putting it on the dashboard and it was sliding around. It wasn't designed for the dashboard. Um, so across the board, drivers are, are really excited for this. Well, Nate from Airbnb was here a couple hours ago, and we were talking about the shared economy. What, where is, where is the shared economy going? How is it evolving? Um, what is, what is the next wave in your mind? Yeah, so I think, I think we've hit the two giant categories of the sharing economy. When you're talking about sharing assets, uh, people's two largest assets, you know, are their house uh, and their car. And you know, Airbnb, uh, I think, has done an incredible job um, of creating a marketplace for people sharing their, their home. And, uh, you know, and Lyft is doing that for people uh, using their, their cars. Um, what, I, what I do think is really interesting is kind of under the umbrella of the sharing economy is the, the impact that it has on, on the future of work. And I think we're just starting to, to scratch the surface there. Um, so, so one interesting thing is, you know, of course, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of, of Lyft drivers across the country, and that's the core part of how the business works. But we've also used this element of, you know, crowdsourcing to power the business. So I referred to it for a second earlier, but uh, whenever somebody new applies to be a Lyft driver, we actually match them up with an existing Lyft driver, a top, top sort of rated, top 20%, uh, and they'll get matched up in real time. It's actually very similar to the experience of being a Lyft passenger. You hit a button, and you know we'll take someone who's on the road and send them a request. You'll meet up in real time, um, and they welcome them to the community and take them through the whole onboarding process. Uh, so we're we're using crowdsourcing to scale our own business, and that's been a, a huge point of leverage that allows us to operate in 60 cities without local offices. We have one local office in New York City. Um, and you know, Airbnb did something similar with, with their photo program. So you know, I'm sure a lot of people know the story, but they've invested heavily in sending contract photographers out to apartments so that they have really incredible photography. And that's a you know, big sort of crowdsourced uh, you know, network of photographers that they use. So we're, <clears throat> we're seeing the, the huge benefit to that. And I think more and more companies will see the opportunity for you know, how to solve some of their hardest you know, operational scaling challenges through kind of crowdsourced networks. What other, are there other industries that you see that you'd say, hey man, if, if I wasn't running Lyft, I would apply some of these same lessons to something else? Or is there anything else that, 
that looks interesting or that you've seen that you've thought, wow, that's a cool way to use, you know, to, to exist in this space? Yeah, there, there are a ton of, ton of exciting companies out there. Um, you know, I'm uh, advising another company called Sprig uh, that does, uh, you know, instant food delivery. It's a high quality organic meal delivered to your door in 10, 15 minutes. So uh, slightly longer than the microwave, uh, but faster than any sort of typical food delivery. Um, Is that Gaga? Is that right? Yeah, yeah exactly, okay. Gaga. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, food is one of those other, other categories where people really care about it being there. You know, you care about a car being there fast and you care about food being there fast. Um, so I think it's exciting to see what's, what's going on in that space. Okay. Um, you know, my final question for you is um, something you've probably spent a lot of time thinking about, and that is um, who will play you in the ride-sharing movie? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but it is a uh, yeah. It's a it's a fascinating space. Maybe Jamie Foxx or something. Been... <laughs> That'd be pretty incredible. Okay, uh, Logan Green. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.